Good afternoon. I'm Bob Roberts, professor and head of the food science department here at the in the College of Agricultural Sciences at Penn State, and I'm excited to be here today for our college um, October College Connections meeting, featuring faculty from my food science department. These webinars are designed to give you a unique inside perspective of the diverse programs, people, priorities, and partnerships within the Penn State College of Agricultural Sciences. We are recording this session. You can find the links to this and all past College Connections webinars, as well as registration information for future events on our college website by searching College Connections. Please note it does take a few days for the recordings to post. Today's session is Bugs in Your Food. I'm joined today by Dr. Ed Dudley, Professor of Food Science, and Dr. Daryl Colburn, Assistant Professor of Food Science. After the presentation, we will have an opportunity for questions and answers, first addressing those questions that were submitted during registration, uh, and then questions from the floor. If you have questions during the presentation, please enter them in the Q&A link, not in the chat, as it's easier for us to track them there. Before we dive in, I'd like to take a minute to introduce our presenters. First is Dr. Ed Dudley. Dr. Dudley has been at Penn State since 2007. He boasts a background in molecular biology, physiology, and genomics of foodborne bacteria with expertise in both beneficial and pathogenic species. His current research program focuses on pathogens. First, looking at the factors that drive the virulence of E. coli 0157H7 and second, developing DNA-based sequencing methods for tracking the spread of pathogens during foodborne outbreaks. Dr. Dudley is the director of Penn State's E. coli Reference Center. He earned a bachelor's degree in microbiology from Penn State and his master's and PhD from the University of Wisconsin. He also did postdoctoral research at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Joining him today is Dr. Daryl Colburn, Daryl has been an assistant professor in the food science department since 2017. His research focuses on the interaction between resistant starch and the gut microbiome using a combination of molecular, biochemical, bioinformatic, and microbiological techniques. He earned his bachelor's and PhD from the University of Guelph in Canada and did postdoctoral studies at the Technical University of Denmark and the University of Michigan. Okay, Ed, take it away. Um, you know, so as Dr. Roberts mentioned, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Edward Dudley. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this um, kind of cool program that we have going on in the Department of Food Science that, uh, as was mentioned, is called uh, Bugs in Your Food. Um, before we start, just want to really uh, kind of highlight the team that we have put together who's driving this grant. Um, so you've already heard the introduction of uh, Dr. Coburn. Um, also includes uh, Dr. Yasna Kovac. Uh, who is a associate professor in food science, who uh, specializes uh, also in uh, genomics of uh, foodborne organisms. Uh, Dr. Josephine Wee, the third one uh, over, uh, also a assistant professor in food science, who is a food mycologist. Uh, and Dr. Jonathan Campbell, uh, all the way over on the right, who is the, uh, the, in the uh, Department of Animal Science. Um, and Jonathan's work uh, centers around the food safety of uh, meat products. I'm going to tell you today about this, you know, wonderful group of students that we've had the uh, the privilege of mentoring and having in our laboratories over the past uh, five summers. This is a program that's run since 2018, and we've done this every single summer, uh, except for 2020, and that needs uh, no introduction uh, at all. And the most recent crowd is the one in the upper right, who we just uh, sent uh, on their way, sent them home a couple of weeks ago. So for anyone who's not familiar with this term REU, or what's actually a much more common, commonly used term REU. Um, so this, the program I'll talk about today, it's funded by the US Department of Agriculture and REU stands for Research and Extension Experiences with Undergraduates. And I say, as opposed to an REU, which is just the uh, research experiences with undergraduates, get rid of the, the extension part. Um, so these are kind of larger national programs that are funded by various federal agencies, including the USDA, the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, and others 
that have the goal of often in the summertime, but these can often be spread out through the course of the year, of trying to get undergraduate students who are in the science and, and uh, technology uh, areas, uh, getting them into research laboratories to engage with real uh, research programs. Now, as I said, these are quite a diverse collection of granting mechanisms. So students in biology and engineering, the sciences, uh, social sciences have a lot of opportunities to uh, participate in these programs. So the USDA, of course, adds that extra E in the middle there, uh, highlighting the special role that extension plays in, uh, um, in agriculture. So the USDA offered this program for the first time in 2016, and our group was first funded in 2017. Uh, first ran for two years between 2018 and 2019, and we called the program Bugs in My Food. So actually, I apologize early. Uh, looking at you know, one or two of the questions that were submitted ahead of time. Uh, this is not a talk about insects in your food. Uh, bugs is actually kind of a colloquial way that uh, microbiologists refer to bacteria and other microorganisms. Um, we were refunded for another five years in uh, 2020, and we've got two more summers you know, to go, 2024 and 2025. Um, so I Kind of highlighted with the, the bullet point at the bottom, you know, the kind of the premise of really what this program is all about and how it got started. So it, it really began through conversations with uh, colleagues at what we call primary undergraduate institutions or PUIs. Uh, so these are your four year colleges uh, and universities that you can find across the US. Uh, where the students do four-year degrees and they either go off to get jobs or they move on somewhere to get uh, to go to uh, graduate school. Um, many of these colleagues I was talking to were mentioning that you know their their students, you know, especially you know thinking focusing here on students who are doing biology degrees, you know, they get excellent educations. Um, but one thing that they noticed is you know first of all many of the students come in with this idea that. You know, really, the, the the career opportunities that are open to them are mostly professional schools, medical, dental, or other. And additionally, uh, they have a diff, you know sometimes have challenges uh, really showing these students what it's like to do uh, hands-on research. And it's often you know many of these smaller institutions, you know, running research labs is expensive stuff, uh, and, and often you know these students might not have access to um, you know some of the the research uh, tools that we have at a much more research intensive place like uh, Penn State. Additionally, what I thought we were thinking would make us a, a little bit uh, different is even if students are coming from PUIs where they, they have a, you know, some good opportunities to get involved in research, you know, often these are going to be experiences outside of the agricultural sciences. And we wanted to design something where these students could get a much greater appreciation of the things that biologists and heck, even chemists or microbiologists or biochemists, things that these folks with these degrees can do that are pertinent to food safety, protecting our crops, protecting our soils, protecting our water, the things that we're really good at in the College of Ag Science. Okay, so kind of a little bit of summarizing some of the stuff I talked about. So we set up this idea of let's run an eight week you know summer research program for undergraduates here at the, the Penn State you know campus um, in which is going to be focused around food microbiology and many of the opportunities that biologists have in uh, food microbiology, but really trying to focus more on what we saw as two really growing areas for opportunities in in food micro, including you know genomic studies. so basically, you know, taking the DNA of a microorganism, generating its sequence, and what what are some of the things that we can learn about that microorganism in terms of its biology? Or for anyone who was on the College Connection from last month with uh, Seth and Sarah Bordenstein talking about the Microbiome Center, um, you know, we also do uh, folk, you know bring these students into the world of metagenomics, which is a part of uh, microbiomes, which again is a very important area for anyone in microbiology to, uh, to learn about and appreciate. Um, additionally, uh, we, as I said, we wanted the students to gain a better appreciation for how majors that are outside 
of a College of Agricultural Science. So the STEM fields, if you're unfamiliar with that term, it's science, technology, engineering, and math. You know, how um, you know, a lot of these relate to careers in agriculture. So we began by putting together a team of mentors at various PUIs across Pennsylvania. You know, we kind of kept it focused on, on Pennsylvania uh, since it was much easier for you know, students to travel, for us to maintain contact with, with uh, some of these mentors. And you know, I've given you just uh, highlighted on this map of Pennsylvania, uh, some of the, the places that we focus on, but we certainly have drawn students from other, other spots. So the majority of our students to date have come from LaRoche College, St. Vincent's College, uh, Mount Aloysius, Juniata, Gettysburg, and Lafayette. But you'll also see in the bottom right, arrow pointing down to uh, you know, the Southeast, uh, indicating that we've had some great partnerships that we've built with the University of Puerto Rico system, particularly uh, their Aguadilla campus, and more recently, their Mayaguez campus. So we receive applicants, usually in the early spring, around January and February. Uh, and if we have to do a down select on applicants, you know, we prefer to try to bring students who are early in their undergraduate career, you know, so get them like, engaged in this area, get their minds thinking, you know, as freshmen or sophomores. Uh, we try to identify students who come from uh, historically under, underrepresented areas in the STEM fields. And also, uh, we ask that they do write a short statement letter. And sometimes it's based on you know, how, how do they communicate their interest in uh, uh, scientific research. So the very first week of this program that we bring them in, again, we're, we're bringing in students who are at very different stages of their undergraduate career. They may have had very different you know, exposures to research. Uh, and we learned very on, very early on, you know, in the first year that we taught this, is that maybe for the second iteration, we should have uh, what we now call a boot camp, where we spend an entire week with all of the students, bringing them through a research project that'll at least make sure, you know, when they finish up on, on Friday, that they have a, a basic core set of, of skills that then they can use in their individual research projects for the rest of the uh, the summer. Um, kind of as an unintended side effect of this, you know, the students are all spending an entire week in the same room together, and it's been great for cohort building. So many of these students, again, they're coming from uh, small colleges and universities, coming to a place as large as Penn State can be a little bit intimidating. And I think this cohort building has been really uh, important to make the community feel a little bit smaller. Uh, so out throughout the week, I just kind of have a general itinerary of what we, we do with them. Uh, Tuesdays, we take them through general lab safety, um, some, some basic uh, you know, microbiological uh, you know, uh, uh, techniques. Um, we teach them some very basic things with microorganisms, such as how do you quantify their growth, uh, doing some simple assays such as gram stain, growing them in, in the laboratory. Uh, on Thursday, Dr. Coburn takes them uh, through an exercise where they uh, take a, an unknown that they've isolated. They extract all of its DNA. They do various tests, such as looking at their resistance to various antibiotics. Uh, and I get the, uh, the uh, to wrap it up on, on Friday, where we take the DNA and we do some various analyses that basically ask, you know, are these unknowns that different students have isolated, are they potentially the same microorganism or are they different? So hopefully they finish up on Friday with a good understanding of lab safety, particularly, um, but also you know, some of the skills that they need for the summer. We also do a fair clip of professional development with these students. These are typically on Mondays. We have about an hour and a half session with them that take them through a lot of different things that, you know, like survival skills, you know, if you will, uh, for them to be successful in the future, whether they go into research uh, or other areas in, in science. So things like how do you read and critique a scientific uh, paper? Um, how do you design a proper scientific study? How do you present your science in an effective uh, you know, uh, oral uh, presentation? Um, some other things, including uh, we have uh, Dr. Patrice Ingram from the, uh, the College of Ag Sciences, um, give a presentation about the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the sciences today. Uh, Dr. Campbell gives them a little bit of background about extension and um, you know what this uh, you know kind of area in agricultural sciences is that most of the students have never heard of before. 
Um, I do a session on how do you apply to graduate school, some tips, tricks, and things that you do and don't want to do in the process. Uh, Dr. Roberts gives a really nice presentation about different careers in the agricultural sciences. And we also have um, some folks from the university come in and teach these kids how to build a LinkedIn page if they don't have one already. And how do they use this to further their um, uh, professional careers? Um, so as I said, you know, the majority of what we do during the summer is get these students into one of our five research laboratories and focusing in on various you know, research projects that uh, somehow relate to uh, food microbiology. So I've just given on this slide kind of an example of eight different projects that have gone on in the last uh, six years. Uh, students in my lab, uh, particularly the students from Puerto Rico, have done some projects in which they've isolated the bacteria E. coli from various farm, dairy farms around Puerto Rico and have uh, studied their antimicrobial uh, resistance. Uh, the next four were all done in Dr. Kovac's uh, group. So she's had students do some really cool things, such as one of them identified a brand new species of a very common and well-known uh, uh, genus of bacteria called Bacillus. Uh, they've looked at uh, various salmonella, you know, that can occur in ecological wastewater treatment facilities. Um, they've used various uh, food grade bacteria called lactic acid bacteria, looked at their ability to inhibit foodborne pathogens like listeria. And she's had a project looking at, uh, you know, uh, different E. coli, again, that can appear on uh, cocoa beans. Uh, Dr. Coburn has done a lot of work with, with his students, you know, looking uh, again in his, his, uh, uh, special, in his background, uh, looking at human gut bacteria and their role in um, you know, utilizing uh, starch-derived oligosaccharides. Dr. Wee has pretty much involved her students with a lot of uh, fungal projects, including looking at different yeasts that can be used in, in wine fermentations. And lastly, Dr. Campbell has um, taken the students through a lot of different uh, food safety assessments of fermented uh, beef products. And if we look all the way in the bottom right, you know, if you've been to the creamery any time in the last couple of years, you may have seen this beef jerky that is supplied uh, called Sweet Carolion. Um, there's also another one called Baja Chipotle. Uh, both of these products were actually developed by students uh, who have come through the REU program. So pretty, pretty cool thing for uh, them to do. So we're not only trying to do introduce these kids to scientific research and you know hands-on um, you know projects, but as I said we're, we're also doing a lot with professional development. So usually in July, around the sixth week of the program, uh, we pack them all up into two vans and we drive them down to College Park, Maryland, where they get a chance to visit the uh, U.S. Food and Drug Administration, specifically the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition. Um, they get a chance to meet with a lot of the scientists who are there. Uh, the FDA has been incredibly gracious in the last few years. They've given several presentations to the students to, to really demonstrate how benchtop science is used to drive uh, food safety regulation in this country. And also, um, I think the students come away with a really a much better appreciation of how their fields relate to careers in uh, uh, government uh, research agencies. Um, so it's always a great trip. And additionally, we uh, use it as an opportunity, take a half day, we swing down into Washington DC to the Washington Mall. Um, yeah, many of these students, this is, uh, you know, have not uh, been outside of Pennsylvania for the Puerto Rican students. Many of them have never left the island. Uh, so this is a really nice opportunity to uh, go out and show them our, our nation's capital. So we wrap up the summer, you know, with a symposium. Again, one of the things we want to do is, you know, uh, you know, kind of enhance the uh, student's ability to present science uh, in an oral format. Uh, so this is always on the last day of the, the program. They're uh, given the, the task of putting together about a 10 minute, you know, PowerPoint presentation of their, their summer work. But additionally, they need to be able to show their ability to identify strengths and weaknesses in their their own uh, work, you know, which is a you know kind of a skill that they're really at those early ages of develop early steps of developing, but are really important for any uh, career. And lastly, we also have their peers 
give them feedback and evaluations about their, their presentations. So they can come away with the summer understanding maybe some things that they do really well when giving oral presentations and maybe some things that they can try working on when they go back to their home institutions and they have to do this again for one of their classes. So we send them all home, usually the last week of July, but that's not the last time that we see them. Uh, so most of the students, you know, we will see again in November. Uh, and that is because we invite them back for a local scientific meeting that's led by the American Society of Microbiology, um, also called ASM. ASM is the largest scientific society in the world that's dedicated to a single um, discipline. There is a branch meeting called the Allegheny Branch of the, a of the American Society for Microbiology that's typically held at a PUI somewhere in Pennsylvania or West Virginia. And the beauty of it is this is a place where students can present posters, they can give oral presentations, and the focus of this meeting is on undergraduate research. So I think it also is a little bit, um, you know, kind of a, a, you know, a less intimidating place for students, for undergraduate students, uh, who are maybe presenting scientific research for the first time, then it would be going to a really large national meeting. Um, so I said, we, we invite all the students back. Um, you know, most years uh, we've had the entire cohort or the entire cohort minus one, you know, return for this. And students have been, you know, given a lot of poster presentations or talks. And this picture is chosen deliberately. So this was from a, uh, a 2019 meeting. Uh, Sharon on the left, Paula on the right. Uh, they walked away first place award in the uh, poster competition. So really proud of both of them. Uh, Paula is now a PhD student at Ohio State University. And uh, Sharon is a PhD student here at Penn State. So it's all fine and good what we think. We think we're doing good things for these students, but we also take the opportunity to get an awful lot of feedback uh, from them. And indeed, a lot of this feedback has driven changes that we've made to the program in the last uh, five years. So we've been doing this uh, really in a focused way for the last three years. We strive to get feedback from at least 10 students every, every summer. A uh, typical class is somewhere between eight and 12 students. Um, and right now, we're really on target with where we wanted to be. We have uh, you know, 32 sets of feedback over three years. And when we wrote the pro proposal initially, uh, we said we were going to get uh, 10 students per year. And part of this is because after the fifth year that we offer this, we want to have enough data that we can do a thorough analysis and submit a peer-reviewed publication about this program. So we, every Friday, the students have the ability to kind of give a, a general evaluation. Most of that evaluation is the same week to week, but it also may have a few new questions based upon something specific that we might have done that week, such as visiting the FDA. And then we also have a, a larger assessment at the end of the summer. Um, give you an idea of what do we ask them. Uh, so this is from uh, really two sets of questions that come from the larger survey. Um, asking them things such as question two and three, before the program and after the program, how would you have rated your overall ability to think and work like a scientist? Questions eight and nine, you know, again, before and after, you know, how comfortable, confident are you in your overall research skills? So that first question, your ability to think like a scientist, you know, on the left, these are the students, how they rank themselves on a scale of one to five before the program. You know, we have a very nice distribution around three, which is, you know, them saying they believe they have a, a they would rank themselves as being moderate in this area. By the end of the program, over on the right, you know, only one person was moderate. Everyone else had now shifted themselves to uh, a good or a great ability. Um, we do the same thing with, uh, you know, so again, the question about research skills. Again, the before on the left, you know, we had students all over the place where some had absolutely no background. They'd never done a research project outside of maybe uh, a research-oriented uh, class at their campuses. Um, a couple students did feel they, they had a, um, some good skills, but by the end of the summer, again, those bars really shifted to the right, you know, as shown on the right-hand side of the slide, uh, where moderate skill was, was the, uh, the lowest rating that students were, were giving themselves. And, you know, the, uh, 
you know, abundance of them rated their skills as good and great. All right, so kind of having, I have a talk a little bit about what we think as mentors, as PIs on this project, you know, where our greatest successes have been. So actually we've had, you know, five summers now, uh, we've had 53 students come through this program. Um, I'd highlighted the places where the majority come from, but there are 11, you know, institutions uh, total. Um, and we're really proud to say that almost half, you know, a little bit less than half or fewer than half of the students uh, come from traditionally underrepresented uh, backgrounds. So it's been a, a very, pretty good uh, success for our program. Uh, we've also had several students who have come back for more than one summer. And indeed, we encourage this because it's one of our beliefs that, you know, hey, one summer is going to have a good impact on you. But if you come back for a second summer, where now you know the department, you know the university, you have a little bit uh, less uh, come up time, now you can actually spend the entire eight weeks fully engaged in a research project. And we've had, a, you know, as I said, several students who have come back and they've done, you know, incredibly well for uh, the for two years. Uh, we've had one student who came back for three. Um, of those 53 students, our retention has been nearly 100%. You know, we've only had one student who has ever left the program early, uh, and that was due to a personal reason and not because they weren't enjoying the program or they weren't they didn't feel they were getting anything out of it. Um, we've had five peer-reviewed publications. When I listed the publications, there were four of them that actually had uh, hyperlinks associated with them. Um, so those four and another one that have actually gone to peer review, um, you know, article uh, publications and have been, been published. Absolutely fantastic thing for students to have on their, their resume. Um, so why we, you know, kind of push it uh, so hard. And additionally, 15 have presented posters at that Allegheny branch meeting, um, some of them at international meetings, including the International Association of Food Protection. Um, Dr. Wee uh, has gotten many students uh, involved in what's called Discovery Space. So this is a uh, kind of a, a science center in downtown State College that's focused around educating uh, kids. Um, and additionally, what's been you know really uh, cool to see, um, our connections with the University of Puerto Rico system have really increased. And this is shown in external funding. Uh, so some things that have come out of the REU program. Um, first bullet point, funded through the National Science Foundation. Uh, this is a program that we abbreviate STAR-P. It's uh, where Dr. Kovac and myself are subcontractors. This is a program where we do something similar to the REU, uh, but it's run out of the University of Puerto Rico, Aguadilla, but it also has an additional component on there in which we're also getting involved in faculty development, you know, with the idea that yeah, it's one thing to, to build the students' competency, confidence, expertise, but if we can also build the, you know, the faculty as well, it'll help uplift everybody. Um, the group of us, uh, Drs. Kovac, Coburn, you know, we and myself, um, actually just graduated our, our cohort of four master's students who are part of this USDA program called the National Needs Foundation. Um, that was training graduate students in food microbiology, but also providing them uh, some additional background in some areas of the computational sciences. You know, we call it data fluency and code competency. Um, and just last month, um, ended up we myself, I got a, a research grant with two faculty members at the University of uh, Puerto Rico, Mayaguez, um, which were taking that publication about looking at antimicrobial resistance in um, Port Puerto Rico dairy farms. And we were able to use that as preliminary data in order to get a research grant in which we're now going to be doing this across the entire island of Puerto Rico for the, for the next four years, uh, trying to assess the abundance and what type of antimicrobial resistance we see in, um, in the dairy chain. Um, and also using this as an opportunity to train farmers about the judicious use of antibiotics and also we say training the next generation of scientists, which we're basically building another research cohort of undergraduates with the idea that this is a antimicrobial resistance as a global and multifaceted um, you know, uh, problem. And we are not gonna solve this unless we engage students early on in their careers, help them recognize uh, many of the opportunities in this area. Um, we couldn't fit all the successes on one slide, so apologize. We're going to go to two slides now. Um, we've also 
uh, sent now that we've been running the program uh, for about six years now, uh, we've seen a lot of students now going off to master's and PhD programs in the biological sciences. I mentioned we actually have three now. Uh, one who just graduated, uh, who came back to Penn State, uh, two to Ohio State, and seven other you know institutions where we have one or more of our our students as well. Uh, we have one student who we know about who's gone off to do what's called a post back. So this is after your bachelor's degree, you go and spend two years at a federal research laboratory. In this case, the National Institutes of Health, and again, you get you engage in, in research for that uh, you know um, for those two years. And we also have students who have gone off to private industry, you know, one who is currently at a cancer therapeutics company in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and another at a pharmaceutical services company in Arecibo, uh, Puerto Rico. It's so going to wrap up, um, you know, using a schematic that the USDA really likes to use when they're trying to educate people about the, the programs that they have available that are designed to enhance the education of students from across the continuum. So they, they refer to this as their educational pipeline. Um, and highlighted in the little tags are various programs they have for students all the way from K-12 to two-year colleges to four-year master's degree, doctoral, and postdoc. And additionally, six different programs that they have that are targeted targeting minority-serving institutions that they hope will fill this pipeline of you know the real you know a need for educated sciences and educated scientists in the agricultural uh, sciences. So I use this to point out you know that one highlighted right there in yellow, that's the REU program where they're hoping to to engage you know most uh, some four year or you know, colleges colleges and universities that have bachelor's programs. Um, as I've already pointed out, we've gotten a, a national needs you know program to kind of complement that. Um, and the student who was involved in that was Ms. Uh, uh, Mary Isabel Menendez Acevedo. And we can see her in the top uh, right picture right there outside the uh, U.S. Food and Drug Administration. And here she is as one of the uh, four students. The fourth one actually wasn't there on the day of the photo, uh, uh, participating in this master's program. And uh, Mary Isabel graduated this past summer and is now a laboratory technician in the Department of uh, Plant Pathology here at Penn State. Another example, again, somebody who started in our REU program, uh, went off to the PhD program, already pointed uh, this talented woman out earlier, uh, Sharon Nevis Miranda. Uh, she was also part of the cohort that Mary Isabel was in, and now she's a PhD student in my laboratory, and it's a picture of my group from this uh, past summer. All right, so we've had a lot of successes uh, with the program. I'll just kind of end with, you know, it hasn't always been, you know, wine and roses, but we do always have some challenges that we're dealing with every every single year. Uh, the first being, you know, increased competition with other REU programs. As I mentioned, these are, uh, there's a large number of these across the country. Uh, so we're always competing for, you know, students, uh, you know, for you know, a lot of the different opportunities they, that they, they have. Um, you know, including some some uh, you know, very different levels of stipends that these programs offer. Um, we've had to turn away in the last couple of years many really outstanding international uh, students. Um, by definition, this is money that's coming for from a federal agency that's targeting undergraduate development uh, by law. You cannot use this to fund international students. They have to be U.S. citizens or permanent residents, but also pointing out uh, the College of Agricultural Sciences, particularly our former you know, associate dean, uh, uh, Dr. Stephen Lorch, has been you know, really instrumental um, in helping us at, at you know, various times uh, and get these uh, students here at, uh, at you know, University Park. Um, it's always a little bit of a challenge maintaining engagement with our external collaborators, but I think we've been pretty successful with that overall. Um, always looking for better ways to track these students. So after they've come through our program, um, you know, and it's uh, and they they leave, and four years later, trying to understand where they've gone. And additionally, it's always challenging. You know, a big university like Penn State that always has policies that are are changing on a year to year basis. Uh, the way that we go about onboarding these students, compensating them for things like travel, it always seems like it's changing. Uh, so it always requires us to pivot. Um, you know, every summer and, and sometimes even the right before the program to try to figure out the best practices. So I will end there. Um, 
you know, getting the uh, picture of the cohort from this would have been 2022 on the very last day of the program. You know, they all got stuffed animals that were actually microorganisms and they're tossing them up. And we've got a great picture here that also shows, again, Dr. Coburn, uh, Dr. Wee, Kovac, um, Campbell and myself and the rest of the uh, crew. Uh, so that's uh, what I have for you today. And I am happy to uh, take any questions. Okay, and thanks very much for a great presentation. Um, and now it's time for questions and answers. Please, if you have any questions you'd like to ask Ed or Daryl or me, um, please enter them in the Q&A portion of the, of the webinar box. Um, we had a few questions that were submitted online prior to the meeting, and I'm just going to bounce them off of uh, Ed and Daryl, and whoever feels like answering can answer. Um, the first question that came up was, why don't primary undergraduate institutions provide more opportunities to engage students in hands-on research? Yeah, I mean, I think I had touched on that a bit in the presentation there, where, you know, an institution like Penn State has a lot more research going on and a lot more resources invested in the research. So we have a number of facilities, instruments, and just overall people doing research that is much greater than is present at those institutions. So inherently, there's just more of those opportunities available here. So I, I think that's really the, the main explanation. I don't know if that has anything else. Yep. Nope, I, I absolutely agree with that. I, I tend to agree as well. <laughs> um, <laughs> the uh, the second question that came in was more broad, and I think, Ed, you're teaching this class this semester. Maybe that you can help with this. What is food microbiology, and where do these students get jobs? <laughs> did, did, did you want to give that a shot, Daryl, or do you want me to? Or what, uh... Uh, I mean, I guess I can start out. You can yeah. add to it. So what is food microbiology? I, I mean, I think it's... Um, a pretty broad category, especially the way we interpret it here. You know, um, traditionally, I think it's a, been a lot tied to food safety, microbiological food safety. So we want to make sure that our foods are pathogen free as, as much as is possible and find ways of tracking these pathogens if outbreaks do occur and things like that. But there's other, uh, that sort of a little bit the dark side of the food microbiology, if you will. There's also the other side of things where, uh, for instance, a lot of microbes are used in fermenting foods uh, in desirable ways. So there's all kinds of things like beer, wine, cheese, yogurt, kombucha, kefir, many other sauerkraut, you know, many other uh, fermented foods where we exploit these microbes to transform these foods uh, in ways that we find desirable. Part of that can actually be increasing the food safety through uh, acidifying these foods, uh, but also they're adding potentially nutrients and uh, changing the overall health properties. Mm -hmm. And then as sort of a third branch, so my expertise is within the gut microbiome, so what's happening after we eat these foods and how that's uh, affecting our health by the way that uh, those microbes in our gut are interacting with these foods. You know, my interest, as, I, as was mentioned, is primarily in resist resistant starch, but there's a number of other food components that these gut microbes are interacting with. And understanding that can help us design foods that, that are healthier by taking that gut microbiome into account as well. Okay, Ted? Yep, and, and yeah, and just add the other uh, another area that uh, you know maybe is is yeah, a little bit more uh, less worked on today than it was you know many many years ago is just food spoilage. Um, mm -hmm. You know how um, you know some of the organisms that will end up in our foods uh, you know eventually cause you know bad taste, bad aroma. Uh, what are some of the ways that we can maybe design or modify a food or simply just use something like temperature? Uh, as a way of controlling their growth in order to preserve foods for longer periods of time. Okay. Was there also a component to that question about where students are getting oh, yeah. jobs after? Yeah. Yes. 
Yeah, I mean, I think quite a wide variety. You know, I think we get a fairly large chunk of our students coming out of here going into the food industry afterwards. Um, lots of demand for food microbiologists within the food industry. Uh, but then there's also, you know, quite quite a wide variety of areas, whether it be within academia, within various government agencies, uh, regulating these foods. Mm -hmm. um, also, you know, some of these skills, you know, they might not end up in a food specific area. They may be able to translate the skills that they develop within food microbiology to other areas. You know, that's particularly true, I think, when we're looking at these sort of data focused uh, projects where the applications, you know, are, are can go well, well beyond uh, foods into any any areas where you're looking at large data sets. Yeah. Anything you'd like to add, Ed? No, I think that was uh, spot on. OK, excellent. Um, sort of the, the idea of. Uh, spoilage and, and safety as well came up in another question from a uh, participant. Uh, some foods seem to be fine to eat even after spending a night out of the fridge. Others I wouldn't trust. Which ingredients or foods are less prone to build up um, undesirable microorganisms if they're temperature abused or I think that's your area, Ed. All right. I was, was going to say, I, I can at least I start off saying I'm not sure I would say that there's like one or two categories of foods, but it's really the kind of the characteristics of the food that we look at that kind of dictates whether we need to refrigerate this or not. So we're looking at, you know, maybe foods that have a, um, you know, a high, high acidity, you know, things that are going to, you know, acidity is something, you know, you, know, you think about uh, foods that uh, taste sour, you know, to us. This is something that we can, that's either inherent to a food or something that we can change that's going to uh, kind of minimize, you know, microbial growth. Sometimes it could be something as simple as what types of nutrients are, are available uh, for them. Um, whole, you know, one side of the coin, take a bottle of water. You know, you can leave that out because there's just not a lot of nutrients for, for different microorganisms, you know, uh, bacteria or yeast to, uh, to grow. Um, we can change the amount of water that's within a, a food or um, the amount of water that is available for, for different uh, microorganisms. So it's, um, you know, I wouldn't say, you know, if you had to, to look for broad categories of things, maybe, dry, you know, dry foods are typically going to be you know, a little bit more, more stable um, and foods that uh, have a good crack of acid in them. Maybe they've been fermented. Although most, you know, many fermented foods, particularly dairy products, we still need to keep refrigerated. Um, or they've had um, the other types of acids that are that are added to them. But um, but again, I don't think there's any. I don't think we can make you know one big um, you know paintbrush broad strokes of a type you know a, a category of foods that are are inherently going to be stable. Well, having having taught food micro for you last semester or last yep. year. I would say there's about six lectures on this. So we could spend quite a bit of time talking about how you design a food to be safe outside of the refrigerator. Exactly. Thanks. Um, yeah, I was going to add the one thing too is, you know, even within a category of food, it may depend on how it was treated before it got yeah. to you as a consumer too. If you take milk as an example, uh, most milk you would be for sure wanting to store in the refrigerator. But if you have an ultra high temperature, uh, pasteurization process, it's actually shelf stable outside of the refrigerator. So it, it, it depends on that processing as well. And not not to be rude, shelf stable until it's open. And then it needs oh, to be yes, refrigerated. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so Ed, um, uh, an interesting question comes to mind. Um, the program runs through 2025. Is it something you think you're going to continue to run? Uh, and, and what would you need to keep that running and make it self-sustaining? Well, I mean, the, the answer to, you know, same thing as a lot of things is money. Um, you know, so I think, yeah, there certainly is the intention uh, to try to find some ways to keep it uh, running. Uh, however, the, the challenge is, you know, it's currently being funded by the, uh, the USDA. Uh, they have decided um, I believe it, you know, a year or two ago that they are not going to do renewals for the same program going ahead in the future. So you actually have to pivot your focus or 
uh, you know, convince them in some other way that you are not running the same exact program that uh, that you've been running for the last five years. And of course, you know, I know that the challenge you know of that is, I mean, they're, they they their expectation is that within five years you have found some way to self sustain the program. You know, but this is you know something where you know between the student stipends, the salaries, all the travel that we do, um, you know, we're running close to you know hundred thousand dollars a year to run this. So it's not a going to be a trivial thing to be able to find funding outside of a you know a federal agency that would uh, that you knew know could uh, stably run run this program. But I think it's also uh, you know the saying in you know the one slide about um, kind of other outcomes. I think there's a lot to be said about using a program like this to drive the development of you know new research or teaching uh, programs you know within uh, all of our programs. Excellent. Uh, I'm looking, we have run to the end of the questions that have come in. Are there any other last questions? Anybody want to offer anything before we close out the webinar? Okay, well, it, then I, I think it's time to wrap things up. Um, thank you, Ed and Daryl, for joining today and for your great presentation. All right, Next certainly. Month, excuse me? No, I said certainly, thank you. Oh. <laughs> Um, next month, I'll be joined by Dr. John Hayes, a professor of food science, and Dr. Helena Hopper, an associate professor of food science and the Rasmussen Career Development Professor to discuss our state-of-the-art sensory evaluation center um, and talk about how you can participate in uh, taste tests. And then in November, we hope you'll join us for a walk in the woods, a look into the private forests in Pennsylvania and beyond with Allison Muth. Director of the James C. Finley Center for Private Forests. In that presentation, they'll discuss the importance of private forests to the Commonwealth and the Eastern United States, management opportunities and challenges, and the research and programs that uh, positively impacting their trajectory. So we thank you for attending today. Um, I hope that you found it enjoyable. I appreciated learning a lot and seeing the success that Ed and Daryl and his their team have uh, had. And we look forward to seeing you. Uh, thank you for joining us and have a great afternoon.